This message entitled, Good Friday, the Ultimate Open Door, was delivered to Christ Our Rock Bible Church on April 2nd, 2021, by the Reverend Roy D. Warren, Jr. The scripture reference is John 19, 17-42. And he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the Place of a Skull, which is in Hebrew, Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side and Jesus in the center. Now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Then many of the Jews read the title, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Therefore the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but he said, I am King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts, to each soldier a part, and also the tunic. Now the tunic was without seam, woven from the top in one piece. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour that disciple took her to his home. All right, praise the Lord. An aging man boarded a bus in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam, with a long journey ahead of him, possibly a 12-hour ride. In his hands, he clutched a box of about 30 Bibles that he was taking to tribal Christians in the highlands. As he looked for a seat on the crowded bus, he pondered how he would get through the many checkpoints along the way without his precious goods being discovered. After finding an empty seat along the aisle, he sat down and placed the box of Bibles on the floor against his leg. A police captain who had followed him onto the bus then took the seat across the aisle from him, casually removing his hat and placed it on the man's box. As the bus coughed and sputtered its way down the road, the man occasionally glanced down at his precious cargo, wondering if he would uh, succeed in delivering it to, the, to its own destination. All too soon, they reached a checkpoint. Police officers boarded the bus, and they were going to check a few ID cards, but they were especially focused on any boxes the passengers had with them, in that they were looking to uh, crunch down on Bibles getting into the country. The man's heart skipped a beat as the officers advanced down the aisle, Soon they were standing by his box of Bibles. He expected the worst. But when they looked at the box and saw that the police captain's cap was resting on top of it, they continued down the aisle to the next passenger. Eventually the man reached his destination and safely delivered God's word to uh, awaiting believers in the highlands. Miracles occur in different and sometimes simple ways. God's hand was, was at work protecting his precious word in this time. When we think about it, miracles happen often. In the rush and the hustle and bustle of life, let us not fail to recognize God's hand, lest we miss the blessing. We've all heard other stories about them getting through, you know, where they look, they, the police look in the back seat and the box is laying right there. Be easy to check it all out and they just, God gets them to look the other way and they make it through with the Bibles. Praise the Lord. And that's what I said with uh, both Voice of the Martyrs and uh, Open Doors. They're 
uh, one of their um, focuses is the, uh, you know, that they are um, uh, looking to get Bibles in. Praise the Lord. Glory be to God. Another scripture that I have here, uh, 19, continues at 28. So it's uh, continuing on from where we were. So this is John 19, uh, beginning with verse 28 and going to 37, okay? And uh, Jim, could I ask you to go ahead and do this one? It's verse 28 through 37 in John 19. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scriptures might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that the Sabbath day was a high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and brake the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they brake not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came out of out blood and water and he said and he that saw it bear record and his record is true and he knoweth that he saith true that that he saith true that ye might believe for these things were done for the scriptures should be fulfilled a bone of him shall not be broken and again another scripture saith they shall look upon him whom they pierced the value of God's word is evident in the price his children have paid and are paying to bring it to the world. It is easy to forget that the access we enjoy to the English language Bibles came at the price of others' suffering. I'm sorry if these kind of sound like commercials. <laughs> uh, I don't mean them to be, to be that way, and I don't think they really are, but this is what we're talking about. This, this is what these people are trying to do, is to get Bibles into people's hands. Bibles that they can read themselves in their own languages. And uh, it says the Bible was first translated into English by a team led by John Wycliffe. Almost, get this, 640 years ago. It was in 1383. Wycliffe died uh, while being persecuted by the church and by government leaders. And his work to translate God's word into our language continued to face strong opposition after his death. The authorities imprisoned and tortured his collaborators. They then dug up his bones and they burned them along with his translation notes. You know, talk about trying to get back at somebody. May we never forget that when we read God's word today because others were willing to illegally translate, print, and deliver Bibles despite fierce opposition that God is having his way. Restrictions on the Bible in Wycliffe's England were much like those seen in today's Iran, where believers own and distribute Persian Bibles at the risk of imprisonment and torture by religious and government leaders. Bold believers in restricted nations continue to pay any price uh, necessary to bring God's word to the most difficult and dangerous mission fields, places where many of our persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ are still waiting for their first Bible. The cover of this month's magazine features one of our sisters in Christ from Myanmar, uh, uh, formerly Burma. She is pictured uh, holding her new copy of the Burmese Bible, which is also known as the Judson Bible in memory of the missionary Adoniram, Adoniram Judson. He lived from 1788 to 1850. Along with his family, Judson endured astonishing suffering 
to translate scripture into the Burmese language. His work to translate the first Burmese Bible took, get this, 24 years. Took 24 years, 1813 to 1837. Costing him a 21 month imprisonment and the loss of his wife, Anne, due to severe illness. After remarrying, he lost his second wife, Sarah, and a daughter to illness, resulting from the extreme conditions of their missionary service. Today, we continue the Judson's work in Myanmar, where the government attempts to restrict access to God's word. We have smuggled more than a quarter million Bibles into the nation in recent years and are currently pursuing opportunities to smuggle large quantities of Bibles to believers in other restricted nations as well. You will read about several of those opportunities in this magazine. We live in a culture that increasingly not only fails to value God's word, but also mocks and ridicules it at about every turn. Sadly, the Bible's truth, the only truth about God, is counterculture in our nation. Now get this, where eight of 10 Americans identify themselves as Christians, eight out of 10 say they're Christians, while less than one in 10 believe the Bible's foundational truth about God. How many times have you heard people say, well, yeah, I met this so-and-so person, you know, and they're born again. They said so. Doesn't impress me any. A lot of people say so. And I'm not saying they couldn't be, but, you know, with these kinds of odds, it's just kind of hard to picture. Eight out of ten Americans identifying themselves as Christians, while less than one in ten believe the Bible's foundational truth about God. May we appreciate God's invaluable word anew and make its truth the centerpiece of our homes and daily lives. And not just an ornament on the coffee table. <laughs> and may we be found faithful in making such or sure that every believer, every believer in hostile areas and restricted nations receives a copy, no matter the cost. Praise the Lord. We've got one last scripture to get to, and once again, it follows. It's John 19, beginning with verse 38, and goes to 42, okay? Uh, Jason, would you go ahead and share this one? Uh, it's 19, John 19, 38 to 42. Praise the Lord. John 19, 38 to 42. Amen. And after this, <clears throat> Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. He came therefore and took the body of Jesus, and there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night, and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. And took they the body of Jesus, and wound it in linen clothes, with the spices, as the manner of the Jews to, is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified there was a garden, and in the garden a new sepulchre, wherein was never man yet laid. There they laid Je Jesus, therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day, for the sepulcher was nigh at hand. Praise the Lord. I want you to back up now. Back up. There's a few things that I want to show you along the way. I'll go quickly with it since we've already taken the time to, to hear these scriptures. Uh, but now I want to explain a few things along the way. Okay? So let's see, where do we start? Um, yeah. 
starting with verse 28. This is 19, John 19, starting with verse 28. Well, let's go before that. Let's go to all the way back to 17, okay? All right. And he, bearing his cross, okay, literally means to be removed, you know, picked up his cross and started carrying it. Now, you know from another gospel that he's not the one that carried it the whole way, that he evidently fell possibly a few times. Movies usually show that he fell a few times. And they, um, they had jo or, uh, uh, Simon of Cyrene. Boy, why does the name escape me like that? Simon of Cyrene. And he picked up that cross and carried it the rest of the way possibly helping Jesus with it, but might have just taken it himself, okay? Bearing the cross, went forth unto a place called the place of the skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha. It literally means rounded skull, rounded skull. So from a distance, it looked like a skull. It had, you know, a couple of open eyes and, and you know, maybe a, a mouth and a little open nose. It looked like a skull, just looked like it, Okay. And that's where they crucified him and two others with him, on, one on either side. And Jesus was right in the middle, okay? Joined to them, however. That's what the word midst means, to be joined to them. And you can see he was. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Well, this title read many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city. It was real close to the entrance. And it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Then said the chief priests of the Jews to Pilate, Write not the king of the Jews, you know, but rather that he said, I am king of the Jews. And Pilate wouldn't have anything to do with that. Pilate said, What I have written, I have written. Don't you try to tell me what to do. It's basically what he's saying. What I've written, I have written. The Greek word is grapho, grapho, and it means to grave or to engrave, you know. It's, I, you know, it's written, and that's it. You'd have to deal with it, okay? He, he was. Because Jesus, Pilate said all along that I can't find anything wrong with this guy. He claims to be the king of the Jews and so forth and so on, and I see no proof otherwise. So this is what it's going to be, people. Get used to it. Okay, I mean, Pilate was taking a real stand here. Uh, and, but, you know, once they start mentioning, we're going to get a hold of Caesar and you're going to be in trouble. <laughs> then it's like, oh boy. <laughs> then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and they made four parts. To every soldier a part. And also his coat. You know, so somebody got the sandals, somebody got the headdress, somebody got, you know, the underwear, undergarments and so forth. But then there was this coat. And it says that it was out without seam, it was woven from the top throughout. Okay? Now, I always hesitate when I know there's a uh, legend, a legendary statement about something in the Bible, because I want to be real clear, you hear me on that, it doesn't mean it's true. Just because it developed into a legend or a story or whatever. But it's possible that this was a piece of the garment that was made by his mother Mary for him. It would take a long time to sew something like this. It did not have any seam in it, okay? And uh, almost like knit, you know? And it was just a, a constant flow of material woven from the top throughout. To weave or to knit is literally what this woven word means. So whether it was Mary or somebody else or he paid for it or whatever, I wouldn't know, but that's the legend about it, that Mary made it for him. Well, anyway, so don't forget that's legend. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not rend it. Let's, let's not, here's the word for schizo, <laughs> you know, like schismatic or, you know, to separate. Let's not cut the thing in half. Let's not tear it in half. Let's let it be a, a, a garment that's going to be worth something. So they cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, uh, which saith, they parted his raiment among them, somebody got shoes, somebody got this, somebody got that, and for my vesture they did cast lots. 
These things, therefore, the soldiers did. Okay? They, they didn't know to do it. They didn't know that it was part of the commandment to do. But it turns out it's exactly what the prophets had forecasted would, would happen. They were going to cast lots. So they didn't know they were being obedient to God on this thing, but they were. Now, there stood by the cross uh, of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus, therefore, saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Behold thy son. This is in the imperative middle tense. Literally means see. Woman, see your son. Okay? Then saith he to the disciples, who is John, okay, behold thy mother. So he's literally giving his mother into the control and into the care of John. Okay? Which would be needed because as it stood, the brothers and sisters of, of Jesus, you know, and really become solid in anything concerning Jesus, you know, by this time. And they were, you know, uh, maybe that was going to be the safest thing is to put, him with, put her with John, which is what they did, and at least for a while. And from that hour, that disciple took her into his own home, a dwelling place, a family, um, a related temple, so to speak, for this family. All right, verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now there was a set of uh, vessel, uh, a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it on a hyssop branch, which is, by the way, not very strong, but they did it, and put it up to his mouth. And when he had received the vinegar, see, this is not the gall. This is not the stuff that would make him loopy. This is not the stuff that was going to, you know, put them out, so to speak, you know. No, this vinegar was uh, something, a sour wine, really, uh, and related to uh, uh, other stuff that they had, you know, to drink, but it wasn't going to be something to get him looped out, okay? And uh, when Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Now, what's real clear about this part of the scripture is that these Romans did not kill him. These Jews did not kill him, even though Jesus said the Jews ha have need for the most forgiveness because they purposely went out to get rid of Jesus. The Romans were just doing what the Jews told them to do. Okay, So Jesus made a distinction there. But nobody killed him. The Bible says he gave his life. He gave it. And the Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation, it was time for the... Uh, see, John's, John's take on the days and the hours and so forth that led up to the cross are a little different than elsewhere. You know, they already had the evening before and they killed the lamb and they did the Passover and all of that. But really... It's on the same day that Jesus is on the cross. Okay? Uh, you can try to figure that out if you want. But that's what it says. It was the preparation. That the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day. For that Sabbath day was a high day. And Saturday, of course, was the regular Sabbath. Okay? But this was a special Sabbath. So watch out. That they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and the other which was crucified with him so that they wouldn't have a leg to stand on. Now they did it on purpose. It wasn't just to hurt them. It was so that when they tried to breathe, which was almost impossible, they'd try to push up on their feet and get a breath. But they can't do that if their legs are broken. So they broke the legs of the two thieves. Okay, Jesus was already dead. All right, verse 33 says, But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and, and blood and water came out, which was a sign that he was indeed dead. He that saw it bear record, that's John, 
and his record is true. John is making it clear. I saw it, and it's for real. And he knoweth that he saith, he saith true, that ye might believe. Okay, that's the final goal, that people would believe. For these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. That's one of them. But the other one was in verse 37. And again, another scripture saith, they, they shall look upon him whom they pierced. That's from Psalm 22, verse 16. The other one was from Psalm 34, verse 20. Okay? Verse 38. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave, told him, yeah, go ahead, take it. And he came, therefore, and took the body of Jesus, praise God, to honor him, to get him buried, to do it right. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night. Remember, he's the one that came and Jesus said, you must be born again. And he didn't understand it. See, this is what I was saying earlier. Uh, you know, all the way through this story, you find people that you would think should know what all this stuff means. They don't get it. But the Bible specifically says that when Jesus is glorified, that's when they got it. So it would have to wait till he was not only dead, but risen from the dead. Okay? Then people would get it. Okay. Then took they the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes with the spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury. And I think it says somewhere here it's about 100 pounds of ointments and you know, powder and I don't know what all. And boy, that would make him a little heavier, huh? You know, you just wrap that all around him, another 100 pounds. Let's just say he was 185 pounds. There's 285 now. You add all this stuff on it. So, you know, not many people are going to be able to carry him around. Now, in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, praise God. And in the garden, a new sepulcher, wherein was never man yet laid. And there laid they Jesus, therefore, because of the Jews, preparation day for the sepulcher was nigh at hand. It was very close by. It made every sense in the in. in the world, really, to take care of this right now. Besides that, Jesus can't stay on the cross past dark. It was, in a sense, illegal. Okay? Now, I want you to remember something. Okay? The Bible says, it's in Isaiah, it says that our own good, our own goodness, none of these people could claim, oh, I'm good. I did this for Jesus, and I did that for Jesus, and, and I did more than you did, and you did more than somebody else did. No, none of that was in the picture, okay? It was just loving Jesus. It was just serving him, okay? Uh, in the heart and in the life, and everything is but filthy rags. If you're going to try to take credit for this stuff, it's filthy rags. And as Jesus hung there on the cross, now listen carefully to this, his heart was open for all to see. When he was on the cross and all the things he said, you know, what about Father, forgive them for they know not what they do? What about all the things Jesus said from the cross? Okay, his heart was open for all to see. Open to the Roman soldiers, for they surely didn't know what they were doing. Jesus said they didn't know what they were doing and surely they did not. It's only in the end that the centurion says, surely this was a righteous man. But it took that time to build up to that, to see that. The religious people did. But by God's grace, as in Isaiah 54 tells us, their seed would inherit the Gentiles and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. His heart was opened to Mary and John. And they would have each other. And they would have the church as it got started from then on. His heart was also opened to a thief. A thief who was willing to be a thief no more. No more of his own strength. No more of his own understanding. No more of his own abilities. No, he needed the heart of Jesus, and that's what he received. Praise God. Yes, it was finished. 
Jesus' part was finished, that is. But this is why the whole thing is the ultimate open door. That's why this whole thing we've been talking about is the ultimate open door. And we have a part in that as well. He gave us his heart. Will we now give him ours? It cost him his life, and so it does for us. Might be in a different way, but it's still the cost of life. But whose life would you rather have? Would you rather have your own and go to hell later? Or would you rather have his life and live in his heavenly righteousness right now and forevermore? But wait a minute. Wait a minute. On Good Friday, the door was ultimately shut. They came to the tomb, the women came to the tomb when they were going to further anoint Jesus. They forgot about the stone. They didn't know the stone had been rolled away. The Bible says an angel rolled it away and they hadn't been there to see it. So they still think it's there. They're not even thinking about the stone. They're not even thinking about you know, finding, did you know that they're not even thinking about finding Jesus alive? They are not. They are hoping to find a dead Jesus. Okay? They didn't know he was alive. They didn't know the resurrection. It's only when he finally was raised from the dead that they saw what was going on. That's what the Bible says. Amen? They didn't get it before he was glorified. On Good Friday, the door was ultimately shut, okay? Not forever shut, but ultimately shut. Praise God, I think we're going to see the door ultimately open. I mean, we already know it's true. We already know it's a done deal, okay? But I mean, come Easter Sunday, we'll see that there's no blocking the way. There's no stopping anybody from getting to Jesus, Praise the Lord. The stone will be rolled away. Already is, technically, for all of us. Okay? But I'm talking about in the story. When we get to Easter Sunday, it will be rolled away. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. What a, an amazing truth we have set before us. We have a Jesus, and he is Lord. Father, I want to thank you, dear God, for this truth here today. Help us to know it in the depths of our hearts, in the depths of our thinking, and in our minds. Hallelujah. Your name is to be glorified. We pray this all, dear God, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Praise God.